Hey y'all, Bill Cork with DTG, Defensive Training Group, and Big Daddy Unlimited. Today I want to talk about a couple of different things. Right now with all the craziness that's been going on uh, with uh, the, the pandemic and more recently with all the civil unrest, we're getting all kinds of people that are just getting started in the, uh, the gun world, whether it's uh, buying their first gun, starting to get training, starting to come out and start shooting, getting their permit, whatever the case may be. A lot of new people are coming into this world, and that's awesome. That's, that's very, very good. Um, glad to see them taking their first steps. And uh, the first thing is, uh, and I already said this, but I can't encourage you enough, if you are getting into guns, go get some training. Uh, seek out a good quality instructor that's going to help you on your journey. Training is a journey, not a destination. That it's going to help you on your journey so that you can go as far as you want to do, uh, as far as you want to go, and get as prepared as you want to be. One of the first things, though, that I want to talk about, um, and I talk to all of my classes and all my students about this, is our life safety brief. Getting into these four primary rules and discussing just why they're so important. So, first of all, words matter. Words can convey information consciously and unconsciously, and we gotta be careful about how we say things because we don't wanna give the wrong impression. So a lot of times with the, the range safety brief, we call it the range safety brief, and the word range kinda gives us the false idea that this maybe is something that applies only on the range. And I want you to think of this as something that applies any and every time you handle a firearm, whether or not you're on the range, in the gun shop, in the car, at home, on the street, wherever this is, these four rules are going to apply. And so I call them a life safety brief rather than a range safety brief, using the word life to reflect this global reality. So rule number one, all guns are always loaded. A lot of times you're going to hear treat all guns as if they're loaded or something along those lines. And I don't like the word treat because to me treat suggests a make-believe, pretend type of mindset. And that's not what I want. Now I understand at the same time all guns are always loaded. It's not a factual statement because I can physically unload a firearm. However, what we're talking about here is a question of respect. Never letting ourselves forget even for a split second that this device can cause serious bodily injury and or death at a moment's lack of focus on our part. So going along with that, we run the gun, the gun does not run us. Now what this means is these are modern firearms are mechanically very, very safe devices. They've got internal safeties, in some cases external safeties. Uh, they're drop safe for the most part. Uh, very, very safe mechanical devices, kind of like your car. Your car's got airbags, your car's got crumple zones, your car has ABS uh, analog brakes, all this kind of stuff. But we still have to drive the vehicle defensively. We can't just go bouncing off stuff as we go down the road. Same thing with a firearm. No matter how many mechanical safeties it has built into it, we are the only safety we can ever count on, the one up here. We are the consciousness that runs this mechanical device. The gun itself is just a mechanical device. So we run the gun, the gun doesn't run us. There are several things I see, particularly with beginners, where we kind of forget this and we let certain things lapse into an afterthought kind of situation. When we're shooting, we get the shot and we drop the gun. Oh, wow, look at that. That was really cool. I just hit the target. And we forget the gun is in our hands and the gun will frequently be down here and like, hey, look what I did. When we get into holster work and we start putting the gun away, uh, this was a problem that I used to have. I used to get on my cops a lot about when I was um, still in law enforcement and doing a lot of law enforcement training was reholstering reluctantly, making sure that our scene is safe before we put that gun away. And then when we put the gun away, making sure we do so carefully and intentfully because we do get into problems, particularly with concealed carry. Shirts and jackets and pull tabs and all kinds of stuff can get caught in that holster potentially and cause problems. So we gotta pay attention to what we're doing. We can't treat that as an afterthought. And then finally, how we unload the gun becomes very important. And I do a demonstration in my classes where I say, pop quiz, and I pull the pistol out. And what I'll do is I will clear the chamber and then remove the magazine, the ammunition source. And I ask the question, I set the weapon down, and I say, is the gun unloaded? Of course, the answer is no, it is not unloaded, because even though I cleared the chamber, the magazine was still in place. So when the, mag when the uh, slide went forward, it stripped another round off of the magazine and loaded the weapon again. So the process that we employ is very important. It's analogous to tying your shoes and then trying to put them on. You did the right steps, but in the wrong order. So in this case, we have to remove the ammunition source, clear the weapon, 
lock the slide open, and then visually and physically inspect the weapon looking for something. And so this is another big point that I like to make, and I got this from one of my mentors. When we look into the chamber, when we visually inspect this weapon, what are we looking for? Are we looking for an empty chamber or are we looking for one live round? I want you to look specifically, intentfully, diligently for one live round. And the first reason for this is, think about all the times you've lost your car keys, your cell phone, your sunglasses, whatever, torn your house apart, come right back to where you first looked, and lo and behold, there it is laying there on the table. It is possible for you to look and not see. Your brain will fill in what it expects to see as opposed to what's actually there. So in this case, if we condition ourselves to look for an empty chamber and something distracts us and so we're not really paying attention, it is possible for our brain to say, it's empty, it's always been empty, don't worry about it, and you're not going to see what you need to see. So I want you to specifically, intentfully, diligently look for one live round. Condition yourself to see that, and that can save you. Rule number two. A lot of times what you'll hear is keep the weapon pointed in a safe direction. And the issue that I have with this is it's good advice, but it presupposes that there is a safe direction. On the range, generally we're going to have that. We're going to have our impact zone, our berm downrange. But even that, though, is contextual, because if someone's downrange setting up a target, that is not a safe direction. So we don't want to give the idea that there is always going to be a safe direction, and that direction is always safe. It's contextual. It's situational. It's circumstantial. It depends on what's going on. So rather than having you look for something that either may not exist or may be in flux, I'm going to tell you, don't point the gun at anything you're not willing to destroy. So the rule I use is never let the muzzle of the weapon cover anything you're not willing to destroy, including parts of your own body. When we're out in the real world, our bad guy that we're engaging, if God forbid that happens, People may be running around completely oblivious to what's going on between you and that other person. And as the good guy, we cannot just spray and pray. We have to be very responsible for every round we put down range because we're responsible for those projectiles. So we have to be aware that our background may change. Our safe direction may change. The bad guy is not in a vacuum. The second part of that is also be aware about covering parts of your own body. And this particularly gets into holster work. I want you to make sure when you're reholstering the weapon that you're not bringing your support hand down or doing something where you're unconsciously flagging yourself as you're putting the gun back in the holster. And this happens, I see this a lot, and uh, until we bring it to the uh, shooter's attention, they're just not aware of it. They haven't really thought about it. So you need to be very aware and specific about where that muzzle is oriented at all times. Never let the muzzle cover anything you're not willing to destroy, including parts of your own body. One additional uh, thought there, some people will tell you that, and they're correct, that in the real world you're probably going to point the gun at things that you're not uh, ready to destroy, that you haven't made a decision to destroy, and that is true. A lot of people I've heard will say, it's going to happen, don't worry about it. And I'm going to respectfully take issue with that and say, it's going to happen, worry about it. Because it is your responsibility. It may not be your fault. And I can think of several circumstances, several instances in my career where I pointed the weapon at something, another teammate or something, that I was not prepared, obviously, to shoot them. It wasn't my fault. Uh, they popped out of a doorway I wasn't expecting. They didn't know I was standing there, and for a split second, I'm pointing my weapon at them. It was my responsibility, though, and I fixed it as quickly as I could, let them move past, got back up on target on the direction that I was covering. So I'm going to say that, yeah, it's going to happen worry about it and fix it as soon as you can because it is your responsibility even if it's not your fault. Rule number three, we're going to keep our finger off of the trigger and on the frame until the weapon is pointed at our target and we have made a conscious decision to fire. So a lot of times what you'll hear is keep, uh, keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to shoot. And that doesn't nearly cover enough information for us. First of all, if I say keep my finger off the trigger and nothing else, it begs the question, well, what do I do with it? So I want it off the trigger, and I don't want it on the trigger guard or floating around somewhere where it can find its way back into the trigger. I want it firmly pressed into the frame with either metal or plastic underneath it. Why is this important? Why do I not want my finger on the trigger or somewhere where it can easily find the trigger? Our hands are designed to grasp. That's what they're meant to do. And we have several hardwired conditions that will further encourage us or could lead us to do this grasping motion without conscious thought. Our startle response, somebody startles us, our hands come up into a protective position and start to claw. 
Our stumble response, we're walking along and we stumble. Our hands will shoot out to try and catch our fall and stop us from falling, and we'll start to clamp on things, even if there's nothing around you. It's just how we're, our brains are wired. Finally, sympathetic squeeze. As I start to fall, if I grab the table, as this hand contracts, this hand will want to contract as well. Sympathetic squeeze, inner limb connection. In all of these cases, if my finger is on or can find its way to the trigger, I can easily generate enough pressure to discharge uh, the weapon, uh, especially in the case of something that doesn't have a manual safety or something along those lines, and uh, unintentionally uh, fire the weapon. So I want to keep my finger firmly pressed into the frame with metal or plastic underneath it until two conditions are met. So ready to shoot. Well, what does that mean? That, that's this way too nebulous for us. In this case, we're going to define ready to shoot as I'm pointed at my target and I've made a conscious decision to fire. Okay? So there are lots of videos on YouTube of people going too fast, drawing the gun and shooting themselves in the lower extremities. Uh, I use that example a lot and I get people that say, okay, Bill, I'm not going to shoot myself. Well, be careful with that. That's not a good attitude to make sure it doesn't happen. Um, you know, things do go wrong and we want to prepare ourselves to make sure they don't through proper practice, proper training. But just to do one better, I can see a situation where something's gone wrong and my daughter is clinging to my leg because she's scared and as I go to draw my pistol, I prematurely touch the trigger and I shoot her in the head. I use that example and people kind of shudder, and even people that don't have kids, it, it drives home. There may be things down here I want to shoot even less than myself. If my target is not in that, or, that area, do not have your finger on the trigger, okay? Uh, we can't risk it. We don't want to shoot ourselves, and we, for God's sake, we don't want to shoot someone like that, someone that's, that's you know, even more important to us than we are. Second situation or second uh, requirement is I have to have made a conscious decision to press the trigger. So we, we see this arise sometimes with certain techniques. Uh, there are techniques where you will start prepping the trigger. As soon as the weapon is pointed at your target, as you are continuing to present, you can start to access that trigger and start to apply, apply pressure and prep the trigger so that when you hit full extension, the gun discharges. Perfectly viable technique. However, the context is I've already made the conscious decision that I'm going to do that. I'm going to press that trigger. If I have not made the conscious decision, law enforcement officers, for example, we point our guns at people far more often than we have to shoot them. Fingers should not be on the trigger when the weapon is pointed at them. We may be perfectly justified in pointing the weapon at them, but if I have not made a conscious decision to actually shoot them, I don't want my finger on or anywhere near that trigger on the frame firmly pressed in with metal or plastic underneath it. Part and parcel of a conscious decision is I have to have identified what it is that I'm pointing the gun at. And I can think of uh, multiple, unfortunately, situations over the past several years where we've seen this happen with tragic results. Uh, homeowner, home defense type situations. Homeowner hears a noise, comes out, sees a shadow, shoots the shadow. Shadow should not have been shot. Uh, there were three cases. There was South Carolina, Texas, and Colorado in the past three, three and a half years at this point where in each case it was an, an, an adult child who would come home unexpectedly from school, and in all three cases the parent came out, saw a shadow, said no one should be in my home, shot the shadow, and killed their child. So uh, we have to identify what it is if we're going to make that conscious decision to shoot it. And that leads us into rule number four. Rule number four is be aware of your target, identify your target, your foreground, and your background. And this also ties into things we talked about with rule number two, that we have to be aware of our target, we have to identify it positively in order to make the conscious decision to shoot it, and then we have to be aware as well as the good guys with what's in front and what's beyond. Okay, we can't just because someone is threatening us blindly unleash a, a salvo. We have to be very specific and be very aware. Additionally, when we're inside of a structure, whether it's our home or anywhere, we have to be aware of not only what is beyond, but potentially what is beyond what is beyond, because most interior walls, even most exterior walls in modern construction are not necessarily ballistic, meaning that they will not necessarily reliably stop bullets. There may be something in the wall cavity, a stud, conduit, piping, whatever that will, but I wouldn't count on it. So we have to be aware not only of what is beyond our bad guy, but potentially what is beyond what is beyond. Is that my kid's bedroom back there? Whatever the case may be. In order to make sure we're not potentially pushing lead into that bedroom if we miss or if the round over penetrates. So that's our life safety brief with our four life safety rules. All guns are always loaded. 
Never let the muzzle of the weapon cover anything you're not willing to destroy, including parts of your own body. Keep your finger off the trigger and on the frame until the weapon is pointed at your target and you've made a conscious decision to fire. Be aware of your target, your foreground, and your background. The next thing I want to talk about, and uh, I've, I've thought about this and was going to put something out uh, in the past couple of months because it was more relevant than during the lockdowns and whatnot when you couldn't get to the range maybe to go and shoot. Uh, it's less relevant now uh, from that type of perspective, but it's still dry practice is what we're going to talk about. Dry practice is still a very important part of your training regimen. Dry practice is defined as practicing your manipulations with an unloaded weapon, a real weapon, but an unloaded weapon. So there are a couple of things that I want you to do if you're going to engage in dry practice that will help set you up for success from a safety perspective. First of all, uh, when I get ready to go do my dry practice, I unload the gun. I check it once, twice, three times, four times. I make absolutely sure the weapon is completely empty of ammunition, the way that I discussed earlier. Magazine's going to come out. I'm going to rack the slide, let the round fall to the deck. Lock my slide open visually and physically inspect the weapon looking for one live round. I'm going to take the weapon, any empty magazines, dummy ammunition, whatever. That's going to go with me to my dry practice spot. All my live ammunition, live magazines is going to stay up uh, in, in my case, up in my bedroom. And I'm going to go downstairs to my office, and I have a wall that backs into the earth. Uh, if, if I make a mistake and launch around, it's not going to hurt anybody. My wife will kill me because I put a hole in the wall, but it's not going to hurt anybody other than me. Um, and this is where I do my dry practice. So come down, check the weapon again. My rule is if I set the weapon down, even for a split second and never take my eyes off of it, when I pick that weapon back up, I check it again. If it leaves my physical control, I check the weapon. It doesn't cost me anything, uh, and it's just to make doubly sure because it's that important. Do my dry practice. Do whatever I have to do, and we could have another conversation about techniques and tips on how to actually do your dry practice. You want to practice as properly as possible, the same kind of stuff that you're going to do when you're on the range. Keep those, those techniques as consistent as you can. But um, for the purposes, of, the purposes of what we're discussing here, uh, at the end of it is where I want to talk right now, is at the end of my dry practice session, the vast majority of negligent discharges that I'm familiar with from my, my circle of friends and law enforcement and in trainers have occurred at the end of a dry practice session where the person reloaded and then decided to get one more perfect press and inadvertently shot something that they didn't intend to shoot. So when you get done with your dry practice, you're going to switch that hat from your dry practice back to your real world hat, go upstairs, load the weapon, and do not blur those lines. Once you're done with your dry practice, go back up, load the weapon, put it back in the lockbox, holster it back up. Do not blur those lines. Keep them very separate, very distinct, and that way you can set yourself up for success and avoid having something that, uh, you know, at best we hope will only res re resort in property damage and not anything more serious. So good luck with that. Uh, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to uh, leave us a comment or reach out, and we'll do whatever we can to help you.